you know, uh, welcome to uh, the folks who have signed in. I think we have other individuals who are still logging on. It's, uh, it's 7.03, so why don't we get started and let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Dr. Charles Fuchs, Charlie Fuchs. I'm the Cancer Center Director at Yale, as well as the Physician in Chief at Smilo Cancer Hospital, and I uh, really appreciate all of you joining us. I think uh, Dr. Liebman and Dr. McGibbon, uh, as you may have overheard our conversation, just how much we appreciate the fact that on a, you know, after a long day and a, an evening, people are, are willing to do it, because this is our first Smilo Shares Forum, and thank you, Renee Gaudet, as well, for pulling us together. And I think it's a really a terrific opportunity for us to, uh, to share what we're trying to do uh, particularly in our really uh, aggressive efforts to combat prostate cancer and to make it clear what we want to avail to the community. And I, I just wanted to offer a, a few remarks before I turn it over to my colleagues. And let me, um, if I may, share my screen. Can, uh, can you guys see it, uh, Bruce or Michael? Is this, is this show up? Excellent. Uh, yes. Oh, great. So, um, you know, I think it's a really exciting time in cancer care and frankly, uh, I think an opportunity that we're really looking to make big impact in in Lower Fairfield County and in Westchester and in the Greenwich region. Let me share a few a little background about who we are. You know, at, at the Yale Cancer Center uh, has really had a, has a very long uh, and storied history with a, a legacy of phenomenal science and research in cancer. Um, as part of the War on Cancer Act in the early 70s. We were one of the original National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center, a, a designation that is only about 40 in institutions across the United States. And we have continued to carry that important designation and the only one in Connecticut uh, since uh, the early 70s. Uh, a really a transformative event was the opening of Smilo Cancer Hospital in New Haven, a 15 story dedicated hospital to cancer care and innovation and research, uh, which has really been a, a real uh, center for what we're doing. But as well, I think another important element in terms of growing our clinical research operation was the opening of a state-of-the-art center for experimental therapeutics for patients who have, to some extent, tried the available therapies, a center here in New Haven where uh, individuals can get access to exciting new drugs. Today, our cancer center is over 450 physicians and scientists, and I'll talk about this in a moment. We have 15 care centers, as we describe them across Connecticut, Rhode Island, who where it's our faculty, our staff, and where we are really committed to embedding destination expert, state-of-the-art care within you know, communities across the region. Um, I should also point out that we renewed our de official designation with the National Cancer Institute in 2018. And because of the great progress we've made in clinical care and research, usually you get a 3% cost of living increase in our grant. And because of the progress we've made, we got an unprecedented record 73% increase in funding. This is our vision, a world leader in cancer care, research, and education. Yale Cancer Center and Smilo Cancer Hospital delivers the transformative scientific discoveries and care innovations that you know leverage Yale University and Yale New Haven Health to bring us closer to a world free of cancer, one patient at a time. That is, we are a diverse community across the region, across disciplines, um, and that ultimately we will leverage all of that talent to ultimately bring to bear the best compassionate expert care to every patient uh, residing throughout our catchment area. Our mission is to provide great care, to conduct the full spectrum of research, to promote public health, to disseminate the innovations that we have here across the world, and to train the next generation of leaders. And you know, one thing that's critically important is, you know, patients when they're diagnosed with cancer, they want to see the experts. And we have experts in each of these domains. Tonight we're focused on genitourinary cancers, prostate cancer. But you know, across our entire region and across disciplines, we bring together physicians, scientists, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, everyone, to actually really create an umbrella that is focused on innovation in each of these particular cancers. 
The other thing we're committed to doing is given the extraordinary talent of science at Yale is to leverage that ultimately to novel treatments and really moving the bar in cancer therapy. This is actually studies that came out of our cancer center led by Yale investigators, by our physicians and faculty just in the past year. And you know, we're talking about practice changing studies in colon cancer, head and neck cancer, bladder cancer, gastric cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer. And what's really interesting about these studies is beyond really informing how we practice medicine, as you see in the red, they have led to food approvals of new therapies with the Food and Drug Administration. Let me just put into context. Most cancer centers, if once every few years you have one approval with the FDA, a new drug approval, that's a big deal. To have four in one year or soon to be four, one's pending, that's unprecedented and really reflective of the great talent we have in our center and some of which you'll hear from tonight. One thing we're committed to, as I mentioned to you, is, is providing this kind of expertise, care, innovation in each community that we reside in. We have these 15 centers across Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, and soon Massachusetts. And one that's because we are committed to having a, a really destination Smilo Center for every patient within 30 minutes. And uh, these are Yale faculty. They are the staff, the nurses, the pharmacists are employed by us. We have uniform policies and procedures. We make sure that the most complex clinical trials can be enabled in each of these centers. And it's an, allowed us to really provide care to a large proportion of patients across the region. As I mentioned to you, we're really committed to bringing clinical trials to each of these sites. In fact, this is the fastest growing part of our, our clinical trial portfolio of new drugs, where um, you know 25% of the patients enrolled in clinical trials are outside of New Haven at places like Greenwich. And obviously, Greenwich is, is something that we're really proud of. We've really, we're now focused now to really expanding what we're doing in Greenwich. We really had our full launch of Smilo at Greenwich beyond what we had been doing in July of last year to expand clinical programs, clinical trials, outreach, to really bring in all disciplines. We're committed now to building, in addition to the Bendheim Center, a new facility on the campus in addition to the Bendheim Center, um, which we're just working on the planning, which includes an extensive multidisciplinary practice space, a breast center, infusion, radiation, clinical research, laboratory, a really a boutique healing garden, a state-of-the-art center that the communities in lower Fairfield County, Westchester can, can leverage. Finally, and I'd, it, I'd be remiss to say, look, life is not the same. We're doing this by Zoom. And COVID certainly has uh, been a, a shock to all of us. But you know, we have made, throughout this time, since this started in February and March, we have remained steadfast. And you know, one thing we've done throughout this is to find new ways to deliver care, to ensure that we continue to be uh, steadfast at giving care to every patient, it, the expert compassionate care to ensure their safety utmost, to protect our staff, to make sure we have the capacity to care for COVID patients, but keep them separate from all our cancer patients. Um, and to really engage our entire community to do that. And I think we've done it brilliantly. Um, the care has continued, the clinical research has continued, and that's something that we want people to know. It's safe to come back. Don't, don't short train yourself on the opportunities to, to get expert cancer care and uh, you know, more to follow. So I, I, I apologize for going so long, but I'm just so proud of the people that you're gonna hear from tonight and and the, what we're doing in the Cancer Center and appreciate um, what everyone is doing to, to hear this out. So let me uh, turn it over to our, to our host who will obviously introduce my other colleagues, but our, we're hosted tonight by Dr. Bruce McGibbon. Dr. McGibbon is a assistant professor of clinical therapeutic radiology and the medical director of radiation oncology at Greenwich Hospital. Um, he received his medical degree from the UCLA School of Medicine and uh, Dr. McGimmon has really been a leader in innovation in radiation oncology with expertise in breast, prostate, lung, uh, rectal, head, neck, and, and brain tumors. And I think 
really um, his interest has been uh, in innovating therapy to look at how we can modify the course of therapy, how we can improve quality of life for people on therapy and, and really innovate because obviously radiation is a critical part of what we do in prostate cancer as well as other diseases. And that level of innovation, I think, is moving the field. So Bruce, uh, thank you for hosting this, for launching this forum and really excited to hear you and the perspectives of Dr. Liebman and Dr. Petrowai. Thank you so much for the uh, opening remarks and the introduction. Uh, we're definitely very excited to have this, uh, this series and share uh, some of the exciting things that are going on in, uh, in the prostate area. Uh, and as Dr. Fuchs just said, there will be uh, three talks. We'll start with Dr. Liebman and then myself and then Dr. Petrolak. Um, we are uh, inviting and encouraging questions. You can put them in through the, through the chat portion. When we're done with the three talks, then I will go through and help moderate those and uh, see which uh, speaker might be uh, the best fit to, to answer them. Uh, but first and foremost, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Liebman. Um, he's an assistant professor of urology and the clinical program leader for prostate and urologic cancers, or the cancer program at the Smile Cancer Hospital. He received his MD from the University of Maryland and completed his general surgery and urology training at Mount Sinai. He then went on to a two-year urologic oncology fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco. His clinical interests include treating patients with prostate, bladder, testicular, and kidney cancers. Okay, thank you so much, Bruce, for the introduction, and I'm thrilled to participate uh, in this uh, exciting and innovative program. So let me just try to share my screen here, and we'll get started with our talk. Um, okay, so I, hopefully you can see everything. You can, are we up here? Uh, not yet. I don't see it yet. Okay, let's see. Bear with me one second. It's giving me a... Okay. Perfect. Great. Can you see me in full screen there? Okay, so... So good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Liebman, uh, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Urology. I'm going to be speaking uh, to you tonight about prostate cancer and really focusing on the early spectrum of the disease, early diagnosis, screening, um, and surgical treatment options. Um, I have no relevant disclosures, um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a urologic oncologist. I'm a uh, urologist who specializes in the treatment of urologic cancers, prostate, bladder, kidney, testicular cancer. Um, my focuses are in patient care, helping patients navigate their treatment and diagnosis um, for presumptive or, or diagnosed, pro diagnosed cancers, and also more broadly understanding and improving how the early, spec the early phase of the disease is managed in terms of diagnosis uh, and early treatment for prostate cancer. So what I'm going to be talking to you tonight about uh, are really four simple questions. Number one, understanding who is at risk for prostate cancer, understanding how prostate cancer is diagnosed, uh, going over some of the treatment options for prostate cancer if it is detected, uh, focusing on the surgical treatment options which we offer, and a very brief overview about what our department is doing at Yale to better understand and treat the disease. So just by way of introduction, what is the prostate? And as you can see in this diagram here, it's really packed in tightly in valuable real estate. It sits between the bladder where urine is stored uh, and the male urethra. Uh, and so it has clearly close proximity to other important structures like the rectum, the nerves and blood vessels responsible for erectile function. It's a gland, um, it's a reproductive organ and its function is to secrete prostatic fluid which is one of the components of semen. So as the prostate enlarge, the, pro the prostate become, can become apparent to, to uh, men for several reasons. The most common one is enlargement, and this happens commonly as people get older. The gland simply enlarges and compresses the urethra. This is a common complaint that we hear about. The symptoms are well known to many. Frequent urination, a need to urinate at night, urgency, a decreased force of stream, and an inability to hold urine. And these may sound familiar. Cancer can also arise in the prostate, uh, which is increasingly common in all men as they age. Um, and um, you know, the question often comes up, what is cancer and 
what is cancer. And the, what we're referring to is uncontrolled cellular growth, which is capable of spreading or invading other tissues. Uh, and so that lives on the spectrum of prostate enlargement um, and other, uh, other things that can happen in the prostate. So that distinction between benign prostate and cancerous prostate uh, is what we're focused on. Prostate cancer is common. It's the most commonly diagnosed non-skin cancer in men with almost 200,000 new cases estimated to be detected in 2020 alone. It is also the second leading cancer killer in men with over uh, 30,000 anticipated deaths from prostate cancer alone uh, this year. Survival is highly dependent on stage. Uh, survival is very high for patients who are diagnosed with prostate cancer at an early stage, but decreases uh, if the cancer has progressed regionally or distantly where survival uh, is, is poor. There are clear risk factors for prostate cancer. Um, and we can think about those separated as the known fixed risk factors, things you really can't help, um, and some of the things which may be modifiable. Some of the known fixed risk factors are age, Prostate cancer is more common as we get older. Race, we know that African-American uh, ancestry is associated with a greater risk for prostate cancer detection um, and poorer outcome from prostate cancer. There are also known genetic uh, alterations associated with the risk of prostate cancer. Um, and family history, having a first degree family relative, a uh, father, a brother um, with prostate cancer is a risk factor. There are also commonly spoken about modifiable risk factors, including diet, lifestyle, and obesity. The link there is not as clearly understood, but are potential modifiable risk factors for the disease. How is prostate cancer diagnosed? Um, when prostate cancer is localized, there are seldom symptoms. And so having urinary symptoms are not necessarily a sign that a man has prostate cancer. The primary way that it is detected is through a rectal examination, or a blood test. Uh, and the blood test is a, something called a prostate-specific antigen, uh, which is a protein marker uh, that uh, can be elevated in, in, uh, in prostate cancer and other conditions of the prostate. When cancer has spread beyond the gland, there, are, um, there can be symptoms that arise, including difficulty urinating, blood in the urine, bone pain, or fatigue. So as I mentioned, PSA is a blood test um, that we commonly use to screen men for prostate cancer. It's exclusively made by cells in the prostate. It does not diagnose prostate cancer, but it can raise suspicion. It's not a perfect test because there can be false positives. The level can be elevated because of infection, inflammation, a large prostate. Um, but of course, the, the reason we do the test is because if it is elevated, it does raise the, the specter of prostate cancer. The question often arises, is prostate cancer helpful, uh, is screening for prostate cancer helpful at reducing the risk of death? And this is some evidence um, th that contrasts the, the change in um, metastatic disease at presentation following the widespread implementation of screening for prostate cancer. So the PSA test really became popularized in the uh, early to mid 1990s, and there has been a precipitous decline in prostate cancer metastasis at presentation and death uh, that is largely attributed uh, to the, uh, the integration of PSA testing. What do the clinical guidelines say for prostate cancer detection? Um, and so we think about these really in a risk stratified approach. There is not one, uh, one size fits all approach for screening for prostate cancer. Um, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network uh, tends to uh, or, or advocates a graded approach. There are clearly patients who are at higher risk, patients with African-American ancestry or known BRCA1 and 2 germline mutations. And in those patients who are in a higher risk category, we recommend testing beginning at an earlier age, beginning at the age of 40 with a baseline PSA level. For patients at average risk who do not have a known family history, um, a baseline PSA test can begin at age 45 and can be repeated every one to two years based on that baseline value. And often the question arises, when should screening for prostate cancer end? Um, and uh, there are differences in opinion, but, uh, but in general, we recommend screening until uh, patients have a life expectancy of less than, than 10 years. Uh, but in some cases, it may still be warranted. 
So what do you do if your PSA is abnormal? Um, and so you mentioned there's sort of a normal uh, distribution, but if the PSA is in the normal range, continued testing is recommended for most patients. Uh, and that's often done with your primary care doctor and can usually be coupled into the um, into annual lab work. But what if that PSA level is higher than expected? And there are options for uh, determining what is the underlying cause. A simple first step is repeating the PSA and making, making sure it's not an aberrant uh, value. There are also biomarkers or tests that are more specific to detecting prostate cancer, as well as advanced imaging that can distinguish between malignant and uh, benign tissue. But the gold standard to, deter to distinguish between benign and uh, prostatic cancer is a biopsy of the prostate. Um, and this is a procedure that is performed generally under local anesthesia uh, using ultrasound guidance where samples are taken from the prostate and, and examined under a microscope. One of the innovations at Yale uh, that Yale has really been in the forefront of is using prostate MRI to help distinguish between benign and prostatic disease, uh, benign and, uh, and cancerous disease. Uh, and what we have found and has been uh, seen in numerous published studies and clinical trials is that uh, high resolution prostate MRI significantly improves the detection of prostate cancer if it's present. Uh, in many cases, it can be difficult to make the diagnosis and uh, an MRI can help distinguish and identify cancerous tumors if present. We also have the technology to take this previous MRI image uh, and use uh, fusion-based technology where we actually guide our, our biopsies to areas of concern uh, that are identified, which significantly improves the detection yield for prostate cancer if present. Like any procedure, there are risks of prostate biopsy, um, and those can be thought of in a few different ways. One risk is a false positive, meaning that the PSA is elevated and there's not cancer there. Um, so a prostate biopsy may be unnecessary, cancer may not be present. There are procedure-specific risks, including infection, seen in about 1 to 4% of patients. Uh, the procedure may be uncomfortable and also anxiety-provoking. There's also a risk of over-detecting small, non-aggressive cancers that may not have become clinically apparent if we did not detect them. And treating indolent cancers that are not dangerous can lead to lasting consequences including urinary incontinence, erectile dysfunction, uh, and uh, bowel toxicity. So what are the options if prostate cancer is found, particularly at an early stage? Um, and I think the kind of the most important point is that all of these options must be tailored to the individual needs and characteristics of each patient. Uh, and I'll really speak about four options that are for, for cancers that are found at a localized phase. The first is called active surveillance, which is a period of careful monitoring of prostate cancer. The second, uh, for cancers that are more aggressive, is surgical removal of the prostate. The third is radiation therapy to the prostate. And the last one is focal therapy, where we attempt to treat a portion of the prostate where we believe the cancer to be localized. Tonight, I'm gonna focus really on these two options. One, careful monitoring of prostate cancer, the second is surgical removal. I'll touch briefly on focal therapy just to give a definition because some people may be curious about that. And I'm going to leave you in, in Dr. McGibbon's capable hands to talk about radiation therapy. So a question often comes up about what is active surveillance? And I'll just provide a working definition for us tonight uh, as the careful monitoring of prostate cancer with the intention of preserving the window for cure should aggressive disease later be found. And what that means is that we're finding a cancer that appears to be low grade, that appears to be not dangerous, and watching it carefully. Should it ever become aggressive or we detect more aggressive features, we would still have the ability to offer curative local therapy. We also, we of course have to think about potential benefits uh, and risks. The benefits involve, include not having treatment, avoiding potential side effects of treatment, um, and the risks include monitoring a cancer, having the awareness of it, um, and a very low but potential risk of the cancer progressing while it is being observed. So who is a candidate for monitoring prostate cancer who is detected? Well, we think it's actually about half of the cancers we, di we diagnose are suitable potentially for active surveillance and not being treated. 
these are predominantly men with low risk cancers, uh, and we make that definition based on having a low PSA level, a low Gleason pattern, which is an estimate of cancer aggressiveness, a small amount of prostate cancer, and no clear evidence of spread beyond the prostate gland. Clearly, patients who are candidates for, for active surveillance have to be well informed and able to attend frequent follow up. And what do we mean by active surveillance? What does this mean? Um, it's a protocol where we carefully monitor, we put patients on a plan that involves PSA testing about every six months, a repeat prostate biopsy uh, to ensure that we have adequately staged the cancer, uh, imaging of the prostate using prostate MRI, as I mentioned, because it can identify areas that are concerning for high-grade disease and regular visits. And the intention here is to offer timely curative treatment if more aggressive disease is later found. The second option, if cancer is more aggressive and, and really focusing here on those cancers that are classified as intermediate and high-risk disease is surgical treatment. Uh, and our objective there is to completely remove the prostate using a robotic-assisted approach. And what is the robot? It's this contraption here that we're, we're showing. Um, but essentially, it involves making small laparoscopic incisions in the abdomen and using the surgical robot to help us more precisely dissect out the prostate and reconstruct the urethra and the bladder afterwards. Some of the advantages are less blood loss, a quicker recovery, uh, and a shorter hospital stay. And lastly, um, focal therapy, which involves treating a portion of the prostate gland where we, we believe the cancer to be detected. Uh, and at Yale, we're increasingly relying on MRI to help make that determination. Previously, we used to de decide how much, of the uh, how much of the prostate to treat based on the distribution of biopsy cores. But because MRI so reliably identifies significant prostate cancer, uh, we, use, we use that as our roadmap for the area to treat. And lastly, I'll end with talking about what we're doing at Yale to improve the diagnosis and treatment of early stage prostate cancer. I think probably the most significant change has been changing the entire paradigm of detection um, through the use of image-guided diagnosis. And here is a sort of a more detailed picture describing how we actually do that diagnosis, how we, how we make that fusion biopsy occur. And it's really a two-step process, which I'll highlight briefly, where we obtain an MRI image before, which is highlighted here, uh, and we work with our radiology colleagues to identify areas that are suspicious for prostate cancer. Then, as the biopsy is occurring, the urologist creates a 3D representation of the prostate using an ultrasound. And in the final step, we merge those two imaging modalities together and help identify the area of concern. So in this picture, this red square represents the area we believe to be cancerous, and the the fusion biopsy machine is going to help us direct our biopsies right to this zone uh, to determine whether or not cancer is present. Uh, and this, this really does work. We have found in, in our data, uh, which has been uh, seen at several other institutions, this yields to about a, this results in about a 30% greater yield of high-risk prostate cancer if present, and also allows us to uh, reduce the number of low-risk cancers uh, that we are detecting. And the last thing that I'll touch on briefly is the use of um, uh, technology and genomic classifiers for patients who, have, who are found to have prostate cancer uh, to help give us more prognostic information and help us make the determination of whether cancers are aggressive or not aggressive. And here are the results of two genomic classifiers, which work by looking at gene expression levels uh, within a tumor uh, taken through biopsy to help us make that determination about whether the cancer is aggressive or non-aggressive. And this has very practical uh, utility in helping us decide if, if a patient is a candidate for active surveillance to really uh, be more certain that their prostate cancer is low risk, uh, or if it's more aggressive to, to uh, point them in the direction of more, uh, more definitive therapy. So I think I'll end there before I run over uh, and conclude by saying that prostate cancer is common in all men. There are risks and benefits to screening for prostate cancer uh, that, are, that are clear, and, and the decision to be screened should really occur within the context of a careful uh, discussion with, uh, with a primary care doctor or a physician who knows you well. 
There are recent advances in image-guided diagnosis, which have changed the paradigm for the early detection of prostate cancer. Um, and that treatment for detected cancer should be based on careful consideration of all of the options, including monitoring or active surveillance for candidates to avoid treatment in situations where it is unlikely to benefit. In terms of treatment modalities, surgery, radiation therapy, and focal therapy are all effective options for men with localized prostate cancers and are all offered at Yale. Um, and lastly, there are improvements that are constantly being iterated upon and constantly underway in terms of the accuracy of diagnosis and treatment. So I will end there. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration. Um, uh, and thank you for the invitation, Bruce. Uh, thanks very much. That was excellent. Um, try to share my screen next here. Uh, let's see, can you see my screen? There, I'll try again. Can you see the screen now? Okay, perfect. All right, very good. Um, start the slideshow. Okay, um, so my talk uh, tonight would be in advances in radiation therapy for prostate cancer. Um, just to reiterate, I'm the medical director for radiation oncology at Greenwich Hospital. I uh, came down here about a year ago when uh, Smilo uh, came down to enhance services here in Greenwich, and before that I was uh, up in the Trumbull site for 10 years. And there's a lot of exciting stuff that's uh, going on in, uh, in this, this space for radiation, so I'll highlight some of those things. Um, the first thing I wanted to show is really just a schematic. Let me see if I can start this slideshow again, but uh, uh, I was having trouble uh, playing through the, uh, the cartoon, but that's okay. If you look at this, uh, this picture on the, on the lower right, this is a picture of the machine that we have at Greenwich. It's made by a company, uh, Varian, which is the market leader in radiation equipment. It's called the True Beam. And uh, this part here, I hope you can see my cursor, is where the patient lies. And this uh, almost C-shaped object is really the, the radiation machine with some of the power of it coming from behind. And uh, the, this area here is the treatment head and the radiation uh, comes down in this direction. And we can spin this machine around the patient and we can move this, this couch so we can approach uh, the treatment site from many different angles and you, with using a lot of different shapes. Um, if we look here, uh, actually, I'm going to come back. If you look at that, this portion, this treatment head, if we zoom in and you were to look up into that head, you would see an object that looks like this. It's called an MLC or a multi leaf collimator. And what this is is a bunch of very thin leaves, uh, metal leaves, if you look inside the side, they're usually made of tungsten or tungsten alloy that are very thick. They're about three inches thick, but very narrow. And as you can see, this has this. Um, it's kind of strange oval oblong shape and we can create any shape we want within that to conform to the target and um, people often ask you know when they come for radiation where is their where's their lead blanket like they get in the dentist's office and we explain that there's no lead blanket on you because uh, the radiation that we use is in the mega voltage range uh, of energy and at the dentist's office is kilovoltage so our uh, radiation is a thousand times more powerful and we go through a lead blanket no problem so what we have instead is the equivalent of a very thick lead blanket of about three inches that's up in the head of the machine. So that's really what's creating not only the, the shaping for how we're trying to get to the target, but how we're protecting you uh, in the room. And this is, uh, there have been advances in the, in the speed that these leaves can move and how thin they can be and how, how broad the fields uh, are. Uh, if we look, uh, and so from the side of the machine, if we look in the lower right corner here, if you look face on at the machine, you see here again is the treatment head, but on the sides, there are two arms that can extend. And this has what's called a cone beam CT, and it comes out uh, when you first put the patient on the table and it spins around, and we get really what looks like a CAT scan image. And so if you look at this image here, 
we've, this is uh, what's called an axial slice. This is a slice through a man's pelvis um, from side to side, let's say along the belt line. And when you look at these images, they, they seem to be reversed in that it's like you're looking at someone from their feet towards their head. So the left side of the screen is actually the right side of the person and the left side is the right side. And this uh, down here is the, the back and here's the front. These objects on the side are the hips. This is the pubic bone here. And right in the center with these uh, circles around, this is the prostate. And the prostate has one, two, three uh, white appearing objects, which are actually uh, fiducials or markers. They're helping us to track the prostate. And behind it is the, the rectum. And if we scrolled up, then on top, like Dr. Liefman was pointing out, his uh, picture is the bladder. And so what we can do is take a planning scan before someone ever comes to treatment. We do a planning scan where we create a certain treatment position and we start to map out how we're gonna design these beams. And then when they come for the daily treatments, we can take this cone beam image and fuse it with the treatment planning image and see you know, just how on target we are and make adjustments. And on that day, for example, for a prostate case, we can check whether the bladder filling is, is suitable, if there's any gas in the rectum that uh, is too much for that day, is there any tip or roll of the pelvis we need to account for? And ultimately, we use these uh, gold markers to, to do some fine, fine tuning, where we're talking about millimeter or submillimeter accuracy. And so in this view here, the, uh, the picture, which is in the top left and the lower right, is the original CAT scan. And the top right and lower left are the comb beam CT. And so you can see that the image quality is not exactly the same, but it's very, 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 very close. And so this is what, um, this is one of the key things that's allowed us to be much more accurate with radiation treatment and to really be, be confident that we're on target each day. So when we tell people when you come in, get treated, we will not treat you unless we're totally satisfied that we're on target. We can get you off the table, reposition, do whatever we need to do to make sure that we're uh, totally satisfied before your treatment. So that's been a, a very nice advance in, uh, in our ability to, to put higher doses to the targets while uh, maintaining or improving side effects. Along with that, and going back to that, uh, that MLC or that multi-leaf collimator, we have been able to advance really the, the style of the radiation that's spit out by the machine. Because ultimately the radiation is going to deposit a dose or an energy in the tissue. And we would love to minimize the normal tissue that's getting that dose. But x-rays uh, are x-rays, so they'll you know, enter you uh, and go straight through you, depositing dose all the way along. They lose their power as they go through, but they're still going through and through. So we have to be creative and work with uh, our physics crew to figure out how to make this better. So on the left side of the screen, you have something which was an advance um, in our field maybe 20, 25 years ago. It was called 3D conformal. And uh, what you did in this case, this is uh, someone who's being treated for uh, cancer oops, of the esophagus. Um, and so this is the heart and the black areas of the lungs, and this is the spinal cord here, and in the center is the target. And the, the color is called the color wash, and it uh, corresponds to uh, a certain amount of doses being used. So the reddish color is higher dose, and the uh, teal is, is medium, and the blue is lower dose. And in this case, they took one beam coming in from the front and one beam from the back, and actually two beams from, from the sides. You see this little speck of blue that's all the way over here. And you can see it's concentrating the dose fairly well here, but you have a lot of dose to the heart, for example, and coming back by the spinal cord. And this uh, fundamentally was limiting how much dose that we could really deliver. So then you come to the right, which is a much more modern technique called intensity modulated radiation therapy, or IMRT. And this is really using the, the full powers of the machine. This is, is figuring out which, uh, you, well, I should say using multiple angles, not just one, two, three, or four angles. Uh, we can, in fact, treat people with a full 360-degree uh, arc, treating all the way around. And we can also use that MLC or that multi-leaf collimator to change the shape and the intensity of the beam at each of those angles. And so when you put all that together, you get a much more refined dose distribution. So you have the same, same colors here, but you can see there's nothing off on the sides. There's really very little, if anything, touching that, that spinal uh, canal there. There's still a little bit in the heart because the heart is right next to the esophagus in this case but it's much more concentrated. So again, you have a safer treatment, more accurate, and allows us, if needed to, to go to a higher dose. Uh, another technique which has become much more uh, common and popular in the last maybe five to eight years is called stereotactic body radiation therapy, or SBRT. 
And uh, this goes by a bunch of different names. SBRT, of course, is one of them. Uh, SABER is another, or stereotactic ablative radiation therapy. And one machine that's become quite famous that uses this technique is called CyberKnife. So a lot of people have seen advertisements for CyberKnife on billboards or on the radio, what have you. And um, there are many machines now that can do SBRT. But the core of it, and this is kind of a, a wordy um, exclamation here, but really what it is, is you're using hyper-precise treatment over a very limited number of treatments. So instead of, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but instead of bringing people for multiple weeks of treatment, you bring them for three, four, or five treatments, usually five treatments in the case of prostate, and you get all the treatment done in, in just those five. Now, to get the power of five treatments in what would usually be a multi-week treatment, uh, those treatments have to be much more powerful per session. So that means that our burden of being extra accurate and really precise goes up even more. And so if you see these pictures down here, now we have an IMRT plan of the prostate. So to look at the anatomy again, here are the hips on the side, pubic bone, rectum here. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little later about what this uh, pink object is, but here we have the, the prostate. And you can see with that same kind of color wash that there's really no significant dose that's off on the side. It's all concentrated right in here. And the image on the right is an image as if we were looking uh, straight through from front to back. And so here in yellow is the bladder. Here's the rectum right behind. Uh, this is the base of the penis here, pubic bone here. And so again, you can see very little dose going to the rectum. The bladder is nicely spared. Uh, you know, a lot of normal tissues are able to be spared using uh, IMRT or SBRT. Uh, one thing that gets certainly a lot of press and a lot of interest from patients uh, is CyberKnife, which I talked about there, and protons. Uh, I'll skip over to CyberKnife since I mentioned it. CyberKnife, if you look at this machine, you can see the shape is totally different than the one I showed you before but with the true beam. This portion here is actually a miniaturized version of that machine, and it's attached to a robot arm, actually a similar robot to what's used to help build cars. And um, it allows this uh, this radiation machine to be manipulated in a, a lot of different spaces throughout the room. And ultimately it comes out as a little pencil beam instead of having that multi-leaf collimator idea. And this machine, the reason it's uh, become somewhat synonymous with certain radiation treatments for prostate is it was the earliest machine used to treat prostate with SBRT. Now the field is advanced so that uh, our machine, the true beam and many others can do SBRT, but you'll still see some uh, offices and some, um, some advertisements just calling it CyberKnife instead of the stereotactic treatment. So it's a very nice machine for what it does. It's not a very flexible machine and it can't do broader treatments or uh, it's not good for longer durations, but it's, it's very good for uh, small treatments. Protons is uh, a whole other exciting thing. Protons um, are very, very expensive machines uh, that um, are growing in number in the US, but are still fairly limited. Um, because of their cost and uh, to install and to, uh, and to maintain. And uh, they have a, a different physics property in terms of how they deposit dose. And before IMRT came along, uh, protons really had a dose advantage in treating prostate cancer compared to the older 3D technique. But once we got IMRT and SBRT and these other things, now we're really able with uh, machines like the TrueBeam to give the same kind of dose uh, deposit uh, as, as a proton machine does. So we're not, right now for protons versus photons, we're not really seeing any significant difference in uh, the outcomes and on the cure rate, on the side effects, but, um, but it is an area of active research because there are some exciting, uh, like I said, physics properties of the machine and, uh, and as a radiation field, we're looking to see uh, which, which cancer types might benefit from that, which uh, don't really need it, and, uh, how to harness that power. But for now, for, for prostate, really there's no, uh, no advantage, protons over photons, or photons over protons. Uh, so to dive in a little bit more into the, you know, how we use uh, radiation prostate cancer, there really are three settings. I'm gonna to touch on two of them. One is intact prostate, uh, meaning you've been diagnosed, no surgery has taken place, you're, you're deciding whether to do surgery, uh, the, really the options Dr. Liebman mentioned, is it active surveillance, surgery, radiation, or focal therapy. And um, there are, within this realm, there are really two major options. One is external beam radiation, which is using kind of machines I've been showing where 
Uh, there's nothing inserted that's radioactive. You're just getting uh, uh, x-rays or protons fired from a distance. And then you have brachytherapy, which is usually a radioactive seed implant. Most of the prostate radiation being done in the US these days is external beam, although there are some, some specialty centers that do brachytherapy. And uh, within the external beam world, there really are three basic approaches. There's that IMRT I've been referring to, which for this setting is usually 40 to 45 treatments. Those are done as uh, 15 minutes per day, five days a week. So you're talking about eight to nine weeks of therapy. Then you have something which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's called moderately hypofractionated IMRT. This is using a little bit higher dose per day, but shortening the treatment to 20 to 28 sessions. And then you have SBRT that I was just mentioning uh, with the five treatments. Um, I won't speak tonight about, uh, unless people have questions, I'm happy to answer in the Q&A, but I don't have any slides on how we're using radiation after prostatectomy, although that's uh, uh, an exciting area where uh, if uh, there seems to be prostate cancer recurrence after surgery, we can often come in and, and try to salvage things with some radiation dose. Uh, and the other setting that I will talk about is oligometastatic. Um, it really, what this is for is metastatic cancer is where it is spread beyond uh, the prostate. Usually we're talking about bones in the case of prostate cancer. And oligo means really just a few. So instead of there being you know, 15 or 20 spots, maybe there's only one spot in a bone or two. And is there something we can do um, to go after those spots is just very limited. So uh, I'll speak from about this moderately hypofractionated radiation. So this is something that was used more in the UK, Canada, some other European countries, and, and is a relatively new uh, comer to the US, a lot brand new. And like I was mentioning, the whole idea is, you know, can we bring men for fewer than eight to nine weeks while still having a, a great toxicity profile and a great cure rate? And the short answer is yes, you can do that. Uh, the cyphic profile between that long course and I'll call this the medium course is very similar. It might have a slightly worse um, set of urinary side effects, meaning a little bit more urgency or frequency of urination or a little bit more of a burning sensation, at least temporarily during treatment, but overall very similar. And uh, the bowel issues, any loose stools or things of that nature that we sometimes get, it looks to be identical. So it seems like for most men, um, that it's a, a very nice trade-off in terms of more convenient, but not really trading anything uh, in exchange for being more convenient. And in fact, the NCCN guidelines, again, that uh, Dr. Liefman was referring to earlier, when you look at the section for radiation, uh, they've now updated that to say that this, this medium version, this moderately hypofractionated, is really the preferred approach uh, for external beam for treating intact prostate cancer. Now, interestingly, with COVID, uh, you know, we have been looking for ways, of course, to make things safer uh, for patients. And one of those things is keeping you out of medical centers. So this has been another um, reason why there's been a much more rapid adoption of this technique than we'd normally see because uh, patients, family members, and you know, physicians and, and medical you know, centers have all been really aligned here. How can we make this safer and shorter? And so this, uh, this data that's around uh, you know, is really, really great to have on hand. Now we know we don't have to bring you for eight to nine weeks, except in very selected cases, uh, we can get the job done in more like four to five weeks or four to five and a half. Um, oligometastatic. So this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I'll, I'll break it down into the top and bottom. So like I was mentioning, oligometastatic is, it has spread somewhere else, but to a very limited degree. And years ago, this is something where we say, well, you know, it's already escaped. We're really just, uh, you know, kind of playing defense here and, and seeing what we can do. Now, you know, I think you'll hear from Dr. Petrolak about how we're getting more aggressive with metastatic disease in general. But when we look at all of the metastatic, we say, you know what, what about getting more aggressive with disease that's around? And so we have two really good trials that looked at that. One was called the STAMPEDE trial, uh, just came out uh, really recently. And it showed that if we go back, even if you have spots outside the, the prostate, if they're limited, if we go back and treat the prostate for 20 treatments, we can have an overall survival benefit. And uh, you know that was something that's been postulated for many years, but now we have the data that says, yes, we absolutely can do that. And uh, it's actually a little bit lower a dose th than we'd use uh, for an earlier stage prostate cancer. So we know that men tolerate it really quite well and it has the survival benefit. So we're, we're starting to offer that a lot more. And the other question is, well, if you're gonna treat the prostate, what about those two bone spots, what should you do? And our feeling was, well, 
I think it makes sense to treat those, but we didn't have the data. Now we have some data, it's called the Oriole trial. And uh, by going after those uh, several spots with a more aggressive treatment like that SBRT, so very focused high dose treatment, uh, we were able to show a progression free survival, meaning that you're not just alive, but things are being held in check. So uh, very exciting uh, application of this fancier version of radiation really trying to help out in the oligometastatic setting. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about space or gel. So this was um, that purple object I was referring to on a prior slide. We have been looking as a field for years for something to help protect the rectum because um, if you look at this figure here, which is again similar to the one Dr. Liebman had showed, you know, the rectum and the prostate, this is looking uh, like slicing from someone straight from the front to the back. The rectum and the prostate usually touch each other and uh, seeing a different view here. So any dose we were giving to the prostate, at least the front part of the rectum would get that same dose. So the higher we went with the curative dose, the higher the rectum uh, got its dose and uh, we were really looking to bring that down. And finally, we have a product called Space or Gel. It's a biodegradable gel. It's inserted uh, by the urologist between the prostate and the rectum. It stays there for three months and then dissolves back to water over another three months. Uh, very well tolerated. It's done uh, using a little bit of uh, anesthesia and it has uh, really helped tremendously to get our uh, dose of the rectum down. And the last time for me is just, just to point out uh, quickly those gold fiducials I'd shown earlier, uh, again with this uh, cone beam CT look here. We often use uh, gold, but other products are there. They're about the size of a grain of rice. And um, so we, uh, we ask our colleagues at Dr. Liebman to do is before coming for radiation planning, we'll have them put in uh, three or four of these gold markers and the gel as part of one procedure. And then they come to us for that radiation planning and we uh, take it from there. With that, uh, that's uh, all my slides. I'll be happy to answer questions later. Um, I appreciate your, your attention. Let me stop sharing the slide. Let's see. Okay, stop share. Okay, very good. Uh, so let me introduce, uh, very good. happy to introduce Dr. Petrolak as our last speaker. He's a professor of medicine and urology and co-leader of the Cancer Signaling Network's research program at the Yale Cancer Center. Uh, he received his medical degree from Case Western uh, Reserve University and joined the, the Yale faculty in 2012. Uh, he is a pioneer in the research and development of new drugs and treatments uh, for prostate, bladder, kidney, and testicular cancer. Uh, for patients fighting these types of cancers, he finds recent developments in the field of immunotherapy to be particularly promising. And he's a national leader in clinical trials for men with prostate and uh, bladder cancer. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Petrolak. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, so I guess we have to share our screen here. I just, while, while we're doing that, was that Carnoustie in your last uh, slide? It looked like Scotland. That was, that was St. Andrews. That's St. Close. Andrews, okay, I was close. I was close. I had the good pleasure of playing on Saturday and Sunday with a young man who uh, was 63rd in the world who missed the cut at the U.S. Open. And man, that's on another level. So, uh, uh, but it was a lot of fun. So how do I, uh, I just hit the share screen here? Uh, yes, exactly. If I can not get too many things here, let's see. Um, and you're all set. You can just okay. I can just go ahead. Terrific. Okay, so uh, it's really great hearing the two lectures from uh, Dr. McGibbon uh, and Dr. Leapman, uh, good friends and colleagues. And what I really would like to focus on, since this is a talk that's for the community and for patients, is how we think about prostate cancer from a medical oncology standpoint. And uh, uh, what I'd like to talk about first is how we all interact. And it's important that your urologists and oncologists communicate. And we at Yale like to look at this in terms of what we call the multidisciplinary approach, which involves all treating clinicians for, your, for the patients, urologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and also your primary care docs as well, because some of these treatments that you're going to receive have implications in terms of your bone health, in terms of your cardiovascular health, and it's important that we're able to focus on that to give you the best care. And that's actually been proven in two different institutions where they have multidisciplinary clinics, 
It doesn't have to be a physical clinic, but the clinicians should be communicating. So at Jefferson, they found that there was a better survival rate for patients with advanced prostate cancer compared to uh, patients uh, who were in the general population. Jefferson uses a multidisciplinary approach. Same thing with the University of Colorado. Both institutions have demonstrated this. That's why it's so important for your physicians to work together to communicate. So we want to optimize our patients' outcomes. We want to improve access to specialty therapies. We want efficacy in patient and clinician schedules. We want to coordinate care and we want to improve provider communication with the patients uh, through the entire course of the patient survivorship. And that includes the team of nurses and nurse practitioners that work with each individual physician. So what's my role as a medical oncologist in the management of urological cancer? So what I do is I'll assess the need for additional therapy in the treatment of urological malignancy. So if Dr. McGibbon has a patient who has localized prostate cancer, as you mentioned before, whether this is oligometastatic disease or localized disease, and they need hormone therapy or other treatment in addition to their hormone, uh, to, to their radiation therapy, we administer that. Same thing with Dr. Liebman. We help decide where, uh, whether the patient needs additional treatment postoperatively, such as a lymph node positive patient uh, after they've had their prostate cancer out. And we want to integrate the specialties to deliver the best care. As we're seeing now, the pathologist is also playing an extremely important role in the management of advanced prostate cancer. And we'll talk about why you should be asking your doctor about whether you have molecular marker testing for your prostate disease. Why Greenwich Hospital, Yale Cancer Center? We have access to personalized care. We interact, urology, radiation oncology, and pathology, and medical oncology all work together. We have a, a weekly tumor board. And one of the jokes uh, that we had, rather than having a multidisciplinary clinic, we have a multidisciplinary office where Dr. Leapman is down the hall from me, Dr. Kohlberg, uh, one of our surgeons, Dr. Kenny, we're all in the same place. And we often converse late at night uh, to help best take care of our patients. What's the problem? We know that prostate cancer is one of the most commonly diagnosed uh, cancers in men. It's 28% of all cancer diagnoses. There is a bit of discordance because it's only about 10% of cancer deaths. It's the second leading cause of cancer death in men. About 30,000 men will die from metastatic disease every year. I think it's important to note, and this, I don't want to scare anybody, but it's important to note that this disease is not curable once it spreads outside, but it's controllable. And we can have patients live five, 10 years with good quality of life, good functional activity, and uh, able to see their grandchildren graduate from college or to enjoy their retirement to do other things. So it's important, again, to define what the goals of care are for our patients. We're moving into a new era in prostate cancer, and this is different than the way we've been thinking about the disease in the past. Breast cancer and lung cancer, the tissue biopsies that are obtained are often looked or interrogated for molecular markers such as HER2 new in a woman with breast cancer and uh, uh, ALK. Uh, EGFR and lung cancer. These are all terms that if, if you have gone through this disease process, you'll, you'll know. But, but again, prostate cancer, we really did not have molecular markers. Now we do. One of the big problems with this disease is the majority of patients have disease in bone. So it's difficult to obtain tissue sometimes through a biopsy. And we can do that, but, but it may be a little bit more work. We're developing newer treat ways of doing this. And this includes looking at plasma DNA, circulating tumor cells, and then novel ways of imaging, such as PET scans or, or novel agents that potentially can detect the disease earlier. This slide reminds me of the fact that all cancer is genetic, but not all cancer is hereditary, because there can be mutations in the germline that are passed down to patients. And BRCA is one that was, is, is really important, not only for treatment, but is also for prognosis. And again, why we want to think about the integrative approach, because if you identify BRCA germlines in a prostate cancer patient, and that's about 2% of all patients with localized disease and 10% of patients with disease that spread, you also want to, you're taking care of the family as well. The sister, the daughter, the sons, those, and the mother and the father, all of those are involved in germline mutations and need to be assessed in terms of their risk for other cancers. So again, it's, it's a large 
it's, it, it, it's, it's a family that you're taking care of. BRCA is now in the news because there are two FDA approved drugs, Olaparib and Rocaparib for this disease. This is a gene mutation that's involved in DNA repair. Why is DNA report, repair important? Well, when you divide your cells, you make another copy of your DNA. If that copy is not the same copy, or if there are mistakes in that copy, you can't edit it out. And if you can't edit it out, those mistakes can translate themselves into mutated proteins. So prostate cancer tends to be more aggressive if you have BRCA. And also, as I mentioned before, you've got to look for other cancers and other family members. Uh, this slide looked, uh, demonstrates the relative risk of different cancers in those patients who have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. Uh, these include uh, breast cancer, melanoma, pancreatic cancer, and ovarian cancer. The other marker that we're looking for as well is microsatellite instability. And this is something that's involved in, again, DNA repair and a way that uh, we correct, uh, the DNA corrects errors and, pro and of course, mutated proteins. So if something's unstable has, or if you have a patient has microsatellite instability, the proteins that come from that particular uh, uh, transcription can be mutated. And then if they're mutated, the body recognizes them as being abnormal. And if they're unstable, you've got a higher rate of having these particular mutated proteins. That makes you likely to respond to immune therapy. And there's an FDA approved drug, pembrolizumab, uh, that, is, that uh, can be administered to patients with prostate cancer. Unfortunately, it's only about 3% of all patients. But remember, 10% BRCA, 10 to 20% DNA repair mutations, and then 3% uh, with microsatellite instability, you should be asking your doctor these questions. Do I have these particular mutations? Because the treatments can be life-changing. So generally, how do we treat advanced prostate cancer? Well, taking testosterone away, prostate cancer cells die. This is done by giving a drug that interferes with testosterone production. Uh, this can be either an antagonist or an agonist. You may have heard of drugs such as Luprolide, Degarelix, um, uh, all of these drugs will lower testosterone levels, and this is called androgen blockade. As I mentioned before, this will control the disease, but it will not cure it. The target is still there. That's the androgen receptor. Imagine, uh, if you will, a lock and key situation. The receptor is the, is the keyhole. Testosterone is the key. And if you turn that key, then uh, the cells divide and can grow. Now, what we do, of course, is with the androgen deprivation therapy, take the keys away. But prostate cancer can be smart, and it can learn to make its own testosterone, or it can change that keyhole such that different ligands or different keys can fit in and activate it. So this is one way that patients become resistant. And this slide shows the natural history of what happens. And uh, we have the initial diagnosis that may be made and treatment by Dr. Liepman uh, or Dr. McGibbon, and then patients certainly can progress. We may want to administer hormone therapy, and then over a period of time, uh, this will respond. The PSAs will drop rapidly. Symptoms will improve, but then you develop something called the castration-resistant state, where the testosterone is left less than 50, and patients then begin to have uh, progression you know, by bone, uh, or progression by PSA or in soft tissue. How do we treat that? We have a variety of different agents that we can administer. And I mentioned before, for MSI high, pembrolizumab is something that's administered. But there are uh, pro uh, drugs such as Cipulucil-T, which is otherwise known as Provenge. That's an immunotherapeutic agent that we administer to patients that will make patients live longer, but generally does not result in a drop in PSA or a um, uh, improvement in soft tissue. We think it just simply slows the disease down. There are other hormonal agents, enzalutamide or extandi, apalutamide, darlutamide, abiraterone or zytiga. These are all FDA approved. There are cytotoxic agents such as docetaxel or cabazitaxel. Uh, then there are DNA damaging agents um, uh, such as radium-223 and then elaparib and rucaparib. The real trick here is how do you sequence these? because uh, these treatments do wear off after periods of time. And 
you know, the numbers that I have here are average numbers, but there's some patients who may get years worth of benefit out of these drugs. And uh, again, how do we select them and understand who's the best patient to receive a particular treatment? One of the things that we're working on Yale is, is a new class of drugs uh, called a Protec. And this is a way of overcoming uh, resistance to hormonal therapy. So we have proteins in our body. We dispose those proteins as they become older, as they become uh, 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 you know, not viable. And there is a system that basically is a garbage scavenger or protein, and that's called the ubiquitin ligase system. And basically what this system does is it recognizes a protein that may be old, it tags it, and then it degrades it, sort of like a garbage collector. Well, Craig Cruz at Yale has developed a drug that accelerates that process. It's called a Protac. And a Protac can bind to a disease-causing protein, such as the androgen receptor, and then accelerate that process and degrade that protein more rapidly than it would be in a normal situation. And in fact, one Protac molecule can degrade 400 androgen receptor proteins. So this is a completely new way of approaching prostate cancer. And we're right now in phase one trials of this particular compound. We presented our preliminary data at ASCO this year. And uh, we, did a, we, we were doing a dose finding study. We're looking also at different uh, correlates from the tissue. In fact, we've actually demonstrated that the androgen receptor is downregulated in human tissue after we administer the PROTAC. Uh, the first patient was entered at Yale in, in August of 2019, and we reported at the ASCO meeting this year, which is the annual meeting, uh, that we had two responding patients in patients who had mutations that were susceptible to that particular PROTAC, and the drug is called ARV110. So we're very, very excited about these preliminary findings. We're moving forward with this in, in a more expanded uh, uh, study, but this is something uh, about the uniqueness of Yale we are able to go from the laboratory to the patient and take some of these new drugs and move forward. Two of the other uh, what things that we're working on right now uh, in collaboration with other institutions are some of these newer molecules called bites. And what a bite is, is an antibody. As you know, an antibody recognizes foreign proteins, foreign viruses, and there's a specific binding site on that antibody that is used for recognition. Well, there's a bispecific or two-part antibody that is designed to recognize something called prostate-specific membrane antigen or prostate stem cell antigen, and then bring that closer to the immune cell and then cause a, uh, uh, a reaction uh, and, and basically help the immune cell kill the cancer cells. These are one of the new generation therapeutics that we're moving forward with at Yale. And then also collaboration uh, with uh, our colleagues in radiation oncology and, and nuclear medicine. We're going to start looking at drugs that, that basically target something called PSMA and link ant antibodies or small molecules to radioactive isotopes that will di di directly deliver isotopes to the cancer cells. There are bone targeted isotopes like radium-223, which Dr. McGimmons uh, collaborates and I collaborate on uh, to administer to patients. But that only targets bone. And we're looking to target more extensive areas such as soft tissue, perhaps liver metastases as well. And there are drugs that are about to be approved by the FDA that are targeting and focusing on this particular area. So in conclusion, we, we are excited about what we're seeing at this cancer center and the leadership of Dr. Fuchs. And uh, we thank him greatly for these opportunities that we have to treat our patients and bring new drugs forward. Uh, but the multidisciplinary approach is, I think, the best way to improve prostate cancer survival. Uh, all of advanced prostate cancer patients now should be sequenced prior to starting treatment to evaluate these patients for markers to treat their advanced disease. And right now we are looking at new agents, new targets, uh, and finding the optimal sequence of these drugs uh, to move forward. One other uh, study, which I didn't mention, which I'm very, very proud of, uh, 2004, uh, I was behind the approval of docetaxel for castrate-resistant prostate cancer. We're now combining docetaxel with pembrolizumab, which is an immunotherapy agent. And that's going, in, that's going forth in an international randomized trial, uh, which we're helping to lead. So there are very many opportunities. Uh, we welcome your input and questions, and I thank you for your attention.
Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Petrzak. Um, yeah, now's a great time. If anyone has a, a question, they can type it in uh, to the, the Q&A portion. I see one, one question there so far, which I'll get to in a second, but I would just ask um, a question of my own for a second for, for Dr. Liebman. The, uh, for image-guided biopsy, I'm just curious, what, if, if, a, if a man comes to you with an LVA PSA, how, what percentage of the time are you getting an MRI if one hasn't been done, and how often are you using MRI-guided biopsy as the first biopsy as opposed to traditional biopsy without that as your first biopsy? Thanks so much, Bruce. That's an excellent question. So we, we are really trying to do an MRI-guided biopsy whenever possible. The rationale for that is that, number one, it improves the diagnostic accuracy of that biopsy. Historically, 40% of men who had an initial negative biopsy, a biopsy showing no cancer, underwent a second biopsy. So the, the rationale behind that is by getting an MRI first, if the biopsy shows no cancer, we can be much more confident in telling that individual, you do not have prostate cancer. So we are successful, uh, probably 90% of our biopsies are MRI guided. Excellent. And, and for men who do active surveillance, and he said doing a repeat biopsy, how far out do you usually do that? One year, year and a half, two years? When, when is that repeat biopsy? Yeah, so we, we try to do the first biopsy within one year of the, di of the diagnosis, just to be sure that we have not understaged the disease. And based on that biopsy, if it, looks, if it still looks reassuring, we will do the second biopsy about one to two years later and space it out subsequently after that. Um, you know, in the early days of active surveillance, there was a lot of uncertainty about how safe it would be to, to wait. Um, but the evidence has really emerged to support pulling back on how intensely we're monitoring patients. And so we will frequently go a two or three or even longer year interval if everything else looks good. Excellent. Thank you. Um, looking at the list here, uh, someone asked a question to me whether the treatments that I had mentioned are also ones used for salvage radiation therapy. So salvage radiation therapy is the term used if we're, at, if we're using radiation after prostatectomy. So in that case, You've done prostatectomy, PSA should go to an undetectable level because at that point you've removed all sources uh, of PSA. But if we see it creeping back up, even at that point to a very low level, like you know, 0.1 or 0.2, then we know that there's a prostate cancer problem. We, uh, we see whether some radiation therapy with the pelvis can be of help. And in that saying, that's called salvage radiation. And it is very similar to the treatments that I was describing before. We treat what's called the prostate bed, which is, uh, as you may imagine, where the prostate was because um, uh, that's still the highest uh, risk area for it to come back. And then depending on the features, what the Gleason grade was, again, how aggressive it looked under the microscope, and uh, whether there are lymph nodes involved, or what were the margins, uh, features like that, or how quickly the PSA is coming up after surgery. So there are some other features we use to see if there's something else we should do. So sometimes we'll add some radiation, at least a medium dose of radiation to the pelvic lymph nodes. Um, sometimes we'll get Dr. Petrolak involved to see if some of that uh, anti-testosterone therapy would be a helper. And uh, really just in the last year or so, I think we're having a, a, an appreciation that going a little bigger in that setting, adding some dose to the pelvic nodes and adding some uh, anti-testosterone therapy can really be a, a big helper. Um, but the fundamentals of using that IMRT and coming for daily treatments, those are the same as some of that uh, earlier intact prostate. And for us, uh, you know, those NCCM guidelines typically recommend 37 to 39 uh, daily treatments for that salvage setting. There are some trials that are ongoing looking at a shorter course, so using that same kind of moderately hypofractionated idea uh, to come for more like 25 or 28 sessions. But I would say that's best done at this point in a clinical trial setting, and we'll see where that, where that goes. Um, Okay, looks like, I got, looks like I got two questions. You got two questions there for Dr. Petra. Okay, so um, they're sort of to uh, work together. One is it sounds like you're sequencing advanced cancers as it makes sense to sequence at an earlier stage. That's a great question. The guidelines are now saying that you should be checking pretty much everybody for BRCA. Um, it's insidious. It pops up. I've seen it pop up in patients without a family history. Um, and, of course, you can get spontaneous germline mutations as well that develop and they're passed on later on. So yes, you need to look for the germline early and then the family should be counseled. So the question is, when do you test these markers for a patient with advanced disease? And also when 
does somatic, when do somatic mutations develop? That is a phenomenally good question, which we don't have an answer to. So the, what I, I tend to do is I will try to do a tissue biopsy first. Um, if it's bone or if it's not available or if it's, if it's archival and very old, uh, I will often do a liquid biopsy uh, to, uh, to assess what, whether there is a somatic mutation or not. Um, I do, I, when I do repeat testing, it's usually when a patient changes the characteristics of their disease. If they have a rapid acceleration, if they have the development of hepatic metast liver metastases, uh, something to suggest that the disease has changed in some way. There really are no guidelines for retesting at this point. And it's really limited by insurance and what people will pay for at this particular time. But it's a phenomenal question because when we're giving drugs to patients, um, you're giving these drugs uh, and it's basically evolution within your body. You kill off the sensitive cells and resistant ones are left. And does that change over time? And do you revert back to a different phenotype again? We really don't know the question. One of the things that we're working on right now at Yale and, and uh, Joe Kim, who works with our group is a really dynamic junior attending. He's looking at trying to induce brokenness. And what do I mean by that? Well, as I said before, 10 to 20% have BRCA somatic or, ger or somatic or germline mutations. If you deprive cancer cells of oxygen, they become hypoxic and they can't repair the DNA as well. So you're effectively inducing brokenness. And Joe actually did a randomized trial where he showed that the progression was about seven months less if you deplete oxygen or give it what's called an anti-angiogenesis agent. And he presented it this year at ASCO. We're, we're now trying to correlate that with the molecular markers. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really an exciting area because now we're gonna try to engineer the cells to induce brokenness. Great. I see a question here. It says, is this presentation going to be available to watch again? Uh, I believe the answer is yes. And uh, Renee may be able to, to speak more about how to, how to find that. I know that after this uh, talk, uh, if you have any additional questions, by the way, you can email to canceranswers at yale.edu. That's canceranswers, all one word, at uh, yale.edu. But yes, this will be available, and uh, we'll figure out how to how let you know uh, how that's so. Um, it looks like there's another one yep. for Dr. Petrolak here. What time frame do you expect the medications currently in trial stages to be released and more broadly used? That's a great question again. So I know that, that um, it, it, this is a really difficult area. I mean, clearly we want to demonstrate that a drug is safe and also effective and trials take quite some time. So if you go back to um, Taxotere, the first patient was treated in 1996. The phase three trial uh, opened in 1999, closed in 2002, and was mature in 2004. So that's eight years from the time that the drug first went to the pa a patient to the time it um, uh, moved forward. So that, that's a long process, and patients can't wait. Uh, there are now accelerated approvals of drugs based upon what we call phase two data. In other words, if the drug shows efficacy, or it looks like it's effective in a small trial that the FDA sends, says it puts a certain um, uh, response rate. So we, we just, in bladder cancer, we just got a drug called Infortimab uh, approved on an accelerated basis in December. And so that's December of 2019. The phase two trial opened about two years before that uh, and then the phase one trials were open in 2012. So it's still a long process, but it's now available to patients. It's a little bit shorter and we'd have to go through the phase three. The phase three was confirmatory. The phase three data was just announced in the press release about three or four days ago, and that was positive. So, uh, you know, I encourage everybody to get involved in clinical trials. If available, talk to your doctors about it. Uh, we try to make a trial available for every disease state. So if you've come in and you've, been on one treatment, treatment A, then you go on treatment B, and we always try to talk to you about trials at a, at a given point. And, and again, we appreciate all the patients who have volunteered uh, for this over time because, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a hard, it's not easy. And, you know, it's, it's an unknown. These patients are pioneers and they're helping us and not only themselves potentially, but other patients in the future. Uh, let's see, I 
one more uh, question for, for Dr. Liebman. Actually, I know this is mainly a cancer talk, but you've touched on uh, a benign prostate enlargement. I know a lot of men that become have a lot of questions about that and drugs like Flomax, but also there are a lot of, um, it seems like there are a lot of procedures, green light laser and one using uh, steam energy and, and various things. What, what do you counsel men who are struggling with, uh, let's say they've seen their primary care doctor, they've been on Flomax or some medicine, it's not really cutting it. What, how are you talking to them? How are you counseling them about uh, options, including procedures for that? Uh, thanks, Bruce. Yeah, it's very much interwoven, right? So the, you know, so men become very often, you know, become aware of their prostate. Having urinary symptoms is almost universal. And so that is relevant to the question of prostate cancer because there's awareness of the prostate. That question about could this be cancer always looms large. So, um, you know, so I think it is important to begin, ha begin having those conversations, clearly make the distinction. Um, but for people who do have benign urinary symptoms, you know, the first line treatments are usually medications to help essentially open up the prostate, let more urine pass out. And that helps, you know, a significant number of men, but there are some who have symptoms that do not respond to medications. And I'm often shocked at how many people don't realize there's something else that you can do. Um, we've made great strides here, and we have a few people who specialize really in this field of minimally invasive treatment for prostate for benign prostate cancer, for, for benign prostate symptoms, so not cancerous disease of the prostate. Uh, one person is named Daniel Kellner, who's outstanding and has really um, become a leader in a laser approach where they essentially treat very, very large prostates, which are not cancerous, by removing the center portion of it, which has a very uh, minimal long-term side effects and can make really profound differences in the quality of life for men who are struggling with urinary issues. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, it looks like there's one more for Dr. Petrolak. This is uh, another nice nuanced question. So are there trials for non-metastatic castrate resistant? Uh, so castrate, yes. Right now we, we are sort of in a limbo period right now because we were working with a vaccine trial, uh, which was basically a PSA vaccine that we're combining with a checkpoint. Uh, there are trials. I right now I'm sort of in between uh, studies. Uh, the standard there there are three standard FDA approved drugs right now. One is apalutamide, one is enzalutamide, and the third is darolutamide. So the, those are drugs you would consider for the situation um, at this point. Now we don't know if, if sequential use of these drugs is is uh, going to give you any more benefit if you fail one and then go on to the other. Uh, but stay tuned. Hopefully there'll be something open within the next six months. We're, we're still recovering from COVID and getting our trials going. So it's been a slow process, but it's, it's moving forward. Excellent. Let's see, we're almost uh, finished with our time. If there are any other questions, I'll just pause for a moment in case uh, any other ones want to be typed in here. Uh, we're waiting. Renee, are you, are you on? Do you have uh, any more specific guidance about how this is going to be available to watch again? Sure. So the video will be posted to YaleCancerCenter.org, and we'll also share it out on social media to all the Smile of Cancer Hospital pages. Great. Uh, one other thing. Uh, I usually, when we open up new trials, I'll put that on Twitter. So if there are those of us who would want to follow the Yale Cancer Center on Twitter, as well as my own Twitter account, which is part of the Yale Cancer Center. Um, and I also try to uh, uh, let people know about new findings that uh, are coming out. Excellent. 